It's Friday, March 11th. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. A new exhibition at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation features artwork that is not complete until gallery visitors interact with it. It feels like a very profound moment to be sharing space with other people and to remember what is special about those encounters and what we have been missing without them. We will have more on a collection of hands-on art meant to bring people together in just a few minutes. Planned Parenthood is suing Missouri health officials for barring the provider from receiving payments for services through the state's Medicaid insurance program. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Fenton reports the Republican-led legislature passed a budget that does not allow Medicaid payments to the state's 11 Planned Parenthood clinics. Planned Parenthood's lawyers say it violates state law to prevent patients from choosing their own health care provider. The state Supreme Court in 2020 found an almost identical Missouri budget measure unconstitutional. A Missouri judge then ruled the state's refusal to reimburse Planned Parenthood for its care of patients was an example of lawmakers using a budget to create policy. Bonnie and Lee Gilmore is vice president for Planned Parenthood St. Louis Region and Southwest Missouri. We're right back to where we started, and we already know how this will end. Taxpayers are going to foot the bill for a few politicians. Lee Gilmore says Missouri is one of several states that have pulled Medicaid funding from Planned Parenthood. I'm Sarah Fenton, St. Louis Public Radio. The Missouri House has passed legislation requiring voters to show a photo ID to cast a ballot. That includes people using the absentee ballot process. Republican State Representative John Simmons says Missouri lets citizens get a non-driver's photo ID that is acceptable for voting. Well over 6,000 of those non-driver's photo ID has been issued through the Secretary of State's office, the Department of Revenue, helping these constituents get the documents they need to get their identification approved. People who do not have a photo ID would be allowed to cast a provisional ballot. The bill is headed to the state Senate. A measure to ban discrimination of students with traditionally black hairstyles is also advancing in Jefferson City. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Kellogg reports the bill is a bipartisan effort. The House voted 133 to 0 to pass the bill. It now goes to the Senate. Under the legislation, schools that receive state funding cannot discriminate against people wearing protective hairstyles, which are defined in the legislation as, quote, resulting from the immutable characteristics of hair texture or type and historically associated with race. Democratic Representative Rachel Prouty spoke on her own experiences of discrimination based on her hair. As a classroom teacher and school counselor, it's certainly something not only I experienced as a student, but I absolutely observed and had to defend against as a classroom teacher and as a school counselor. The bill does create some exemptions, including allowing institutions to implement safety precautions like requiring hairnets or coverings in a technical training course. In Jefferson City, I'm Sarah Kellogg, St. Louis Public Radio. Missouri's Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is rolling out a new way to hold schools accountable. The updated improvement program has been in the works since 2017. It examines information including scores from standardized testing. Division of Learning Services Deputy Commissioner Tracy Hines says the initiative focuses on continuous improvement. While most of our conversation has focused on the performance aspect, there are also other elements um, to creating a healthy school system. We want all of our schools, all of our students to always be continuously growing and improving. A public comment period runs through March 25th. Public hearings will be held this spring and summer. The Cardinals' home opener will be against the Pittsburgh Pirates on April 7th. That's because Major League players and owners have reached a new collective bargaining agreement ending a lockout. The deal means there will be significant changes, including the designated hitter coming to the National League, and the number of playoff teams is expanding to 12. Hi, this is Shula Newman. You've likely heard Wayne refer to me at the end of The Gateway. Well, I am real. And I'm interrupting this podcast to remind you that the excellent journalism you hear every day on The Gateway is only possible because people like you are willing to give financial support to St. Louis Public Radio. Please do your part to support our journalism. It's simple to do. Just go to stlpr.org. Thank you. And now back to Wayne. It's common for museum visitors to see signs with the message, please don't touch the art. That's not the case at the Pulitzer Art Foundation's Assembly Required exhibition. It features works from nine artists encouraging visitors to touch, sometimes bend, fold, stack, or even wrap around people. St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin took a tour of the show. 
Pulitzer Arts Foundation curator Stephanie Weisberg says that two years of the coronavirus pandemic have made the show particularly timely. It feels like a very profound moment to be sharing space with other people and to remember what it means when we come together in person and what is special about those encounters and what we have been missing without them. One morning this week, I explored the exhibition with curatorial associate Heather Alexis Smith, who helped assemble the show. It's clear as soon as you walk through the door that this is a hands-on environment. So we walk into the building, and the first thing is there's a mat here. And uh, what does the sign there say? A work to be stepped on. You can step, you can hop, you can jump right onto it. So I do. And there's some footprints already. Yeah, it looks like somebody's really come down on it and, and maybe stomped their feet into it, which is exactly what Yoko Ono intended when she created this piece. There's more work by Yoko Ono, 100 note cards, each with an instruction on it to the viewer. Some of these are more conceptual and some of them are more concrete and more practical. Exactly. Um, um, this one, steal all the clocks and watches in the world, destroy them. Yeah, I mean, I, you could feasibly do it, but you might also be prompted to think about time and, and the demands that are made on you by time and timeliness. So many of them you can do, but many more are just prompts for poetic meditation or thinking more deeply about how we might engage with the world. In a downstairs gallery, there's a table with two sculptures on it. They're made of hinged pieces of metal in different shapes, squares, rectangles, circles. Smith tells me they are by Brazilian artist Leisha Clark. Clark really wanted to find ways to make members of the public into artists. And she actually said that these were not artworks until people, aside from her, actively manipulated and touched and played with them. Let's do that. Okay. Can we? Yeah. I sit down and start moving flaps around with help from my guide. For the brief time we work with it, the heavy sculpture comes to life. And yeah, here's one large size that would change everything if we flatten it out. Yep. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> all right. So there's all, all kinds of ways to yep. complete this, as she said. Exactly. Although it's only complete in the moment you're sitting here. Exactly. And then it's incomplete again when and you then walk when away. You, when you leave, it's no longer living. So parts of the show are definitely fun, but much of it is quite serious. You can walk into Elio Oitasica's sculpture, a sort of multicolored cage resting on a pile of gravel. The artist had in mind the homes impoverished people in Rio de Janeiro have built from discarded materials. Franz Erhard Walter's textile art is playful. Visitors can wrap themselves up in the fabric. But curator Stephanie Weisberg says the concept is rooted in Walter's experience as a child in Nazi Germany. He saw collaborative art as a way out of that darkness. He came to the conclusion that art was one of the most powerful tools in which some change could be created. And the decision to create artwork that involved the collaboration of multiple people and brought people together was something that he saw as key to, to resisting oppression. Down in the gallery showing Leisha Clark's work, I try out another hands-on piece with Heather Alexis Smith, the curatorial associate. It's two sets of goggles connected with eyepieces that rotate between clear glass and mirrors. So I'll put one side on and... I can, can see, see you. Me. And you can also look at yourself with those mirrors, too. So I'm going to put them on. Oh, cool. I'm going to lean in here. OK. It's really wild how they alter your perception. So yeah. I'm looking at my eyes right now. But if we tilt them, we can kind of make each other out here. If I spin this little mirror dial, now I can see you again. I've got, <laughs> OK, I think I have you in my left eye and me in my right eye Exactly, right now. yeah. It's wild. Yeah. <laughs> As I head out of the galleries, it occurs to me that an exercise in seeing myself and someone else and vice versa is pretty valuable. And that maybe there's a way to leave the goggles in the museum, but create a similar effect in the mind. I'm Jeremy Goodwin, St. Louis Public Radio. Our David Casares edited that report. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I am out for the next week. Several people will be at the helm of this daily extravaganza starting Monday with Jonathan All. I'm Wayne Pratt. This has been The Gateway.
Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.